What's up, I'm Vin, and today I wanna to go through the 2003 Calc AB Multiple Choice No Calculator section. So let's get started. And for this first question here, we're doing the chain rule. So we're gonna do the derivative of the outside, and we're using power rule on the outside. So we have two times x to the third plus one to the first, but now we keep the inside the same, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is three x squared. So another power rule. And now just multiply two times three x squared to get six x squared, and keep the stuff in parentheses intact. And you have x to the third plus one. So this is going to match up with choice E. For question two, we can do a U substitution, but it really helps to have this formula for the AP test. So when you have E to a constant times X DX, you can skip the U sub process and just write one over the constant times E to the constant times X. And if this is an indefinite integral, we would have to write plus C. But for this one, it's a definite integral. So we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. And in this case here, if we pay careful attention, K is equal to negative four. So once again, we could skip u sub and just use this formula. This is one over negative four, e to the negative four x, and we're evaluating this from zero to one. So one thing I like to do is anytime there's a constant in front of my function, when I plug in the upper lower limits and subtract, I like to write the constant on the outside. And just know one over negative four, we could write as negative one fourth like this. And when we plug in, we're gonna have e to the negative four times one minus e to the negative four times zero is just gonna give us e to the zero. So now we'll simplify this a little bit more and I'll write it over here. This is gonna be negative one fourth times e to the negative four and then minus e to the zero is one. And notice none of the answers are factored so we have to do a little bit of algebra here. We're gonna distribute. And this is looking like it's gonna be choice D just by seeing how this distributes. If I do negative one fourth times negative one first, that's gonna make positive one fourth and then if I do negative one fourth times e to the negative four, that's gonna give us minus e to the negative four over four. So this definitely matches choice D. For question three, we have to know the limit definition of a horizontal asymptote, but just in case you forget that definition, what does it mean for a function to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals two? Well, that means that the function is gonna get closer and closer to this line without quite crossing it as x goes to infinity. So in the long run, the end behavior is that the function gets closer to the line y equals two. So looking at this, this would tell me if I had to write an actual limit for this, is that the limit as x goes to infinity, as we go all the way to the right, or we could be going all the way left, but the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of our function f of x is approaching two. And right away that matches up with choice e. For question four, you have to know the quotient rule. So we have u over v prime is equal to v u prime minus u v prime over v squared. So if we call the top function u and the bottom function v, the derivative, and I'll just write this as y prime, is equal to v, that's the bottom function. So you have three x plus two times the derivative of the top function is just two. And then minus, we have the top function two x plus three over the derivative of the bottom function is three. And then we divide all of this by the denominator squared. So we have three x plus two squared like this. So the rest is gonna be algebra. We're gonna distribute the two and we're gonna have six x plus four. And then here, just be careful, we have to distribute the three and the minus. So I think of this as distributing a negative three. So what we'd have is if we do three times two x, we're gonna have six x, and then three times three is nine, but I'm gonna distribute a minus two. So I'm gonna have minus six x, and then I'm gonna have minus nine, all over three x plus two squared. And we'll make this a little bit darker. So now six x minus six x is gonna cancel. And you can see here four minus, four minus nine is gonna give us negative five. So we have negative five over three x plus two squared. And that's gonna to correspond to choice D. For question five, we have to know the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the antiderivative of sine x is negative cosine x. So we have negative cosine x, and we're evaluating this from zero to pi over four. Now, just in case, if you forget the antiderivative of sine, you could always check your antiderivative by taking the derivative and seeing if it brings you right back to the integrand. So if we take the derivative of cosine, we get minus sine. So minus minus sine is sine x. So that's a good sign for us. So what we have is we're gonna take the negative in front and I'm just gonna treat that as a negative one. And I'm gonna write the constant on the outside. And then we're gonna do cosine at pi over four minus cosine of zero. So once again, anytime I have a constant, especially a negative constant, I like to write it on the outside. Then I plug in the up, upper and lower limits and subtract them. So now I'm gonna write the rest over here. We have negative one times cosine of pi over four is square root two over two, and then minus cosine of zero is one. But when we distribute the negative one here, this is gonna give us, we'll have negative root two over two 
plus one, and this looks like it's gonna correspond with choice D. So for question six, we're taking a limit as X goes to infinity, and we have a rational function here. And when you're taking limits at infinity, plus or minus, the leading terms are the most important ones, and that's not necessarily the first term. It's the power of X that has the greatest power on top and bottom. So you could just eyeball this and see like, all right, this is gonna be one over four, and it's choice C. But if you want to show a little bit more work, you could take a new limit as x goes to infinity of just the leading term on top, x to the third, over the leading term on bottom, which is 4x to the third. And you could see here that x to the third and x to the third cancel out, leaving you with the coefficients in front, which on top you have a 1 and on bottom you have a 4. So definitely choice C. For question 7, we have a graph of f prime, and we want to make a true statement about the function f of x. Now, the most common mistake with these questions is people look at this and say, all right, this graph is increasing from 1 to 2, so f must be increasing from 1 to 2, but that's a very dangerous trap. What I notice for questions like this is that if this is a graph of f prime, I notice this part of the graph that I'm highlighting in purple is positive. So in this portion of the graph, from negative 2 to 0, f prime is greater than 0 because the graph is above the x-axis, which means f is increasing. So we have to know the meaning of the derivative for a question like this. And then for this portion of the graph here, from 0 to 2, we could see that the graph is negative. So from 0 to 2, the graph of f prime is less than 0, so that means f is decreasing. And now we just look to the answer key and see if any of these match up. And notice here that we have f is increasing from negative 2 to 0, so this is definitely going to be choice B. For question 8, we have to know how to do u substitution. So we're going to say u is equal to x to the third. And then the derivative, we have du, is equal to 3x squared dx. Now there's a number of ways you could proceed from here, but a lot of students favor solving for dx. So I'm going to divide both sides by 3x squared. And that's going to tell us that du over 3x squared is equal to dx. So these are two very important pieces, this one here and this one here. So now what we do is, we're going to transform this integral. We have the integral, and for a moment, I'm going to write an x squared. But now we're going to have cosine of u. We're replacing x to the third with u. And dx, we solved for, is du over 3x squared. And if you do the u sub correctly, the x terms are going to cancel out completely, and your new integral is going to be in terms of the new variable u. So now notice I have a 3 in the denominator. So this I could write outside of the integral as a 1 third. And I have the integral cosine u du. So then from here, I just have to say, what's the antiderivative of cosine u? And that's going to be sine u, and we tack on the plus c at the end. And now just substitute back in. u, we define to be x to the third. So there's going to be 1 third x to the third plus c. And this is going to match up with choice b. Question 9 is chain rule. And just know, the chain rule is going to show up a million times on the AP test. So make sure you're awesome at the chain rule. And if you want to know the chain rule variance, especially for natural log of f of x, Anytime you take the derivative of natural log of a function, it's 1 over the function, and then the derivative of the function goes on top. So when I look at something like this, after doing a million of these, you just say, all right, the inside, x plus 4 plus e to the negative 3x, this is going to go on bottom, and now in the numerator, I'm going to take the derivative of the inside. So just think of, I know it's annoying to see f of x here, and this is the definition of the function, but just know the inside function is what we're referring to in this formula. And then what we have is the derivative of the inside is 1 plus the derivative of 4 is 0. And notice to take the derivative of e to the minus 3x, we have to know the chain rule yet again. So the derivative of e to a constant times x is the constant times e to the constant times x. So we have 1 plus, and this is going to make negative 3e to the negative 3x. So this is the term that we're adding here. So now this, we're going to plug in 0. So we have f prime of 0 equals, and on top we're going to have 1 plus, so we have 1 plus, and then we have negative 3 e to the 0, over, and then on bottom we have 0 plus 4 plus e to the 0. So now to simplify this, e to the 0 is 1, so we get 1 minus 3 on top, over 4 plus 1, and this is going to give us negative 2 over 5, which corresponds to choice A. So this is a nice question. We have f of x, f prime, and f double prime are all negative for all real values x, which of the following could be the graph? So just know, when f is negative, that means that this is under the x-axis. If f prime is negative, that means the curve is decreasing. And I'll just abbreviate. And when f double prime is negative, that means that the curve is frowning. And what do we mean by frowning? Just think of a sad face. So if this is a person, this is what I mean by frowning. Okay, but these three things have to happen at the same time. 
Now, it's not going to be choice A because you see the curve is increasing here. So this curve has to be strictly decreasing, so A is out. Choice B looks like the answer because notice we're under the x-axis. This curve is just dropping down and it's frowning at us. So choice B looks like it. But if I had to go through the other ones and why they're not true, this one is increasing. We need our curve to be decreasing since we said F prime is always negative. This one here looks like it's concave up. The curve is smiling at this location. So over here, the second derivative would be positive. So not choice D. And then why is choice E no good? Well, we said the graph F has to be less than zero for this. F is greater than zero, which eliminates that condition that F is always negative. So definitely choice B. Now for question 11, we have to know how to do U sub for definite integrals. So they gave us the definition of U. U is equal to 2x plus 1. So when we calculate du, this is going to be equal to 2dx, which tells us that du divided by 2 is equal to dx. So what we need to be able to do for definite integral u subs is we have to find new limits. And the trick to being good at this is you have to know that the original definite integral is in terms of x. So these are x equals 0, x equals 2 limits. So your new limits are going to be in terms of u. So we take x equals 2 and we plug it into our definition of u over here. So our new upper limit is going to be 2 times 2 plus 1, which is going to be equal to 5. And then the new lower limit, we're going to plug in x equals 0 into our definition of u. That's going to give us 2 times 0 plus 1, which is equal to 1. So now with all of this, we could transform our integral. The integral is now going to go from 1 to 5. And we have the square root of u. And then instead of dx, dx is equal to du divided by 2. And the divide by 2, we could just write in front as 1 half. And if we look around for this one, this is going to match up with choice C. Now for question 12, we have to know what it means for two things to be directly proportional. So if I say y is directly proportional to x, that means that y is equal to kx, like this, where k is a constant. If I had something called an inverse proportion, so an inverse proportion occurs when you have x times y equals a constant, or in, in other words, we could say y equals k over x. So in this case here, we're going with the blue formula that a direct proportion is when one thing is equal to a constant times the other thing. So what they're telling us here is that the rate of change of the volume, and this we have to translate, the rate of change of the volume, this part here, is something we could express as dv over dt. And they're telling us it's directly proportional, so that's equal to k times the square root of the volume, and square root of volume is just square root of v. And now we just look to the answer key, and this is going to match up with choice this looks like choice, and I'm just going to use my eyesight here, choice E. So that's going to be our solution to 12. For question 13, we have to know what it means for a function to be continuous but not differentiable. So in I like to call it the third grade definition. Continuous means that we could draw it in one motion. Differentiable means that it's smooth. So not differentiable would mean that we have a sharp turn somewhere. So when we piece that together, where on the graph is the function continuous but not differentiable. So where can we draw this in one motion, but we're going to have a sharp turn? And notice that's going to be right over here at x equals a. So we're continuous at a because we could draw this in one motion, but that sharp turn means we're not differentiable. So definitely choice a. For question 14, we have to be able to do the product rule and the chain rule simultaneously. So if you ever get stuck on a question like this, I call this the training wheels method, that you could set this up using the formula instead of trying to do everything in your head. And let's say you want to define each piece. You say u is equal to the first thing, x squared, and then v is equal to sine of 2x. So now we're going to find u prime, which is equal to 2x, and then v prime is equal to the derivative of sine 2x. And just know, anytime you're taking the derivative of sine times a constant times x, it's going to be equal to the constant times cosine of the constant times x. So here, this is going to be equal to 2 cosine of 2x. So we're doing the derivative of the outside is cosine, keep the inside is 2x, and the derivative of 2x is 2. So now we just apply the formula. So the formula here says that it's equal to u prime times v plus u times v prime. So this derivative we'll write over here is going to be equal to 2x sine 2x and then plus 2 times x squared is 2x squared and then cosine of 2x. So now we just have to look for this and it looks like this is going to be factored. So I'm just going to do one more step of algebra. We factor out a 2x. We're going to have sine 2x left plus x cosine 2x on the inside when we factor out a 2x from 2x squared. And now we go looking for this, and this looks like it's going to match up with choice E. 
For question 15, we're looking for where f of x is decreasing. And when I hear that phrase, f of x is decreasing, the first thing that comes to mind is that f prime of x is less than zero. So if we want to find out where our derivative is less than zero, first we have to find the critical points. And I'll just abbreviate that over here, cp for critical points. And it's going to be x equals, and just know the sneaky critical point is where the first derivative is undefined. And notice if x is equal to zero, the whole first derivative is undefined. So I'm just going to write the, uh, the sneaky critical point here first. And now the more obvious one is when we set f prime of x equal to 0. So if we set x squared minus 2 over x equal to 0, we could do the algebra here. We can multiply everything by x. And that's going to give us x to the third minus 2 is equal to 0. And if we do the rest of the algebra, we have x to the third equals 2, which tells us x is equal to the cube root of 2. So that's our other critical point here. And what makes this a little bit annoying is that we don't know the domain of the function f. If they said f is defined for all real numbers, then this is definitely a critical point. But what we have to do is when we make the sign chart, we have to consider the possibility that there is going to be a change around 0. Because if we ignore the 0 here, this could be one of those sneaky answer choices that throws us all off. So we have 0 and cube root 2. So now we're going to plug in test values to the derivative before 0 between 0 and cube root 2, and then after cube root 2. So if you plug in something like, let's say, negative 1, f prime of negative 1, if we plug in, is going to give us negative 1 squared minus 2 over negative 1. And now we have 1 plus 2, which is going to be positive. So that means f is increasing from negative infinity to 0. But now let's see what happens when we plug in something between 0 and cube root 2, like 1. This is going to give us 1 squared minus 2 over 1, which that is going to be 1 minus 2 which is negative 1, which is less than 0. So we're negative on this interval. And now if we plug in a number greater than cube root 2, let's say we plug in a number like 2 to our first derivative, we're going to have 2 squared minus 2 divided by 2. And this, if we work this out, is 4 minus 1, which is 3. And 3 is greater than 0. So notice, if we had not considered 0 and just plugged in 1, we would fall into the trap of saying that this function here is going to be decreasing from negative infinity to cube root 2. Even though that's not an answer choice, it's just good practice to show all this work. But notice the function is decreasing, and we're going with choice D here, from 0 to cube root 2. For a question like 16, I like to draw these out to make sense of them, because sometimes it could be confusing what they're even asking for. So we have the line tangent to the graph of f at the point 1, 7. So 1, 7, I'll just draw something kind of random here. We'll just say 1, 7 is all the way up here. So the line tangent to the graph at this point passes through negative 2, negative 2, which would be somewhere in this range over here. So that means if we connected these two like this, and let's try to draw that a little bit nicer. So here like this, all right, that was a better line. That whatever this curve looks like, let's say the curve looks, I don't know, something like this. That this is the graph of f of x, the line tangent at 1, 7 also goes through the point negative 2, negative 2. So that means what we could do is we could find the slope of this tangent line at x equals 1. So to find the slope here, this is the point 1, 7. We're going to use this formula. The slope is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So the slope of our tangent line here is going to be 7 minus negative 2 over 1 minus negative 2. And this is going to give us 9 divided by 1 plus 2. And that's going to give us 3. So the slope of this line is going to be 3. And that tells us we have to think about this a little bit carefully. The slope of the tangent line is the value of f prime of 1. So f prime of 1, this means the slope of the tangent line to f of x at x equals 1. And we just found the slope of that tangent line to be equal to 3. So our value here is going to match up with choice C. Question 17 is nice. We have to determine where f is concave down. And notice we're starting at f of x. So we're looking for where f double prime of x is less than 0. And what we have here is we're going to have to do product rule twice. So for the first derivative, let's say I define 2x to be my u term. Then I'm going to do the derivative of 2x is 2 times e to the x. And then I have plus 2x times the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So that's one round of product rule. But I highly advise for questions like this that don't do product rule right away. I would factor out a greatest common factor first. So we could take out a 2e to the x, and we're going to be left with 1 plus x right after this. So notice when we factor this out, this is what we're left with. So now when we have to do the second derivative, 
we're doing, this is our new u term, the derivative of 2e to the x is 2e to the x times 1 plus x, and then we have plus 2e to the x times the derivative of the inside is 1. So now from here, we could factor this, f double prime of x, we could factor out another 2e to the x power, and we're left with 1 plus x, but then plus, this is the sneaky leftover. So when we factor out a 2e to the x, we're left with 1 plus x here, but here we're left with plus 1. So when we simplify this, this is 2e to the x times 2 plus x. So now when we look at this, one thing that shows up some, well, it'll show up sometimes. Anytime you have to interpret 2e to the x or e to any power, just know e to any power is always positive. So this is always positive. So when you're looking for the root of this, 2 plus x is going to be the only thing that tells you where the second derivative is equal to 0. So 2 plus x equals 0 when x equals negative 2. So when we make our sign chart, f double prime, we're only going to mark this off at negative 2. And now a nice number to plug in would be negative 3. And if we plug in negative 3, we have 2 minus 3 is negative. But remember, this is always positive. So you have something that's always positive times something negative. So it's going to be negative to the left of negative 2. And if you plug in something greater than negative 2, like 0, you're going to have something always positive times 2 plus 0. So you're going to have something positive times 2, which is going to be something positive. And remember, we're looking for where the second derivative is negative. So it's going to be when x is less than negative 2. And that's going to correspond with choice A. So for question 18, we're told that g is continuous, that it has exactly two zeros. This is very important. And that the domain is all real numbers for g. And what we're actually trying to find here is where is g decreasing? On which intervals? And what we have is a table of values for g prime. So the fact that we have exactly two zeros, notice that we have a zero at x equals negative 2. And we have a zero at x equals positive 2. Now, the reason why they told us this is that there's no sneaky zeros anywhere else in this table of values for g prime or anywhere else for g prime. So that means if you were to make a sign chart, g prime, the only roots occur at x equals negative 2 and positive 2. And let's say I test the value to the left, like negative 3. Notice my derivative is positive to the left of negative 2. So I have a positive first derivative. And then between negative 2 and 2, my derivative is negative. And then after 2, the y values are positive again. So what this means is that g of x, and maybe we'll do this in a different color. So g of x starts off increasing because g prime is positive. Then it decreases, and then it increases again. So where is g decreasing? It's decreasing between negative 2 and 2 only. So question 19 looks like a differential equation. It's just phrased a little awkwardly. So we're told that the slope is 2x plus 3 at any point x, y in the curve. That means that dy dx... That's another, that's another way of saying slope in calculus. The derivative is equal to 2x plus 3 for any point x, y on the curve. And we want to know what's the equation for the curve if it passes through the point 1, 2. So this is our initial condition we're going to use. And what we're going to do here is separation of variables. We can multiply both sides by dx. And that's going to tell us, we'll put this side in parentheses, that dy is equal to 2x plus 3 dx. And now to solve for the equation y, we're going to take the antiderivative of both sides. And we're going to have y equals the antiderivative of 2x. We'll have 2x squared over 2, which is just x squared, plus the antiderivative of 3 is 3x. And then we have a plus c at the end. But now this is the initial condition that y of 1 is equal to 2. So if we use that, y of 1 is equal to 1. So we could say 1 squared plus 3 times 1 plus c, and we're told y of 1 is equal to 2, which tells us if we solve this out, and we'll do this over here, that we're going to have 1 plus 3, which is going to give us 4 plus c equals 2, so c is equal to negative 2. So now we could take this value for c and plug it back into this line, and it tells us our equation is y equals x squared plus 3x plus c, which is minus 2, so we're going to have x squared plus 3x minus 2. This is choice d. Question 20 is continuity and differentiability of piecewise functions. So these Roman numeral questions, you just have to go through them one at a time. So the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x exists. This is one of those less than or equal to greater than piecewise functions. So this means we have to check the left side and we have to check the right side. So we won't worry about notation here, but for a limit to exist, the left and right side limits have to match. So if we plug in 3 on the left side when we're less than or equal to 3, so just be mindful 
that if three is on the number line, when we're less than or equal to three, notice we're on the left side of three. So we would have, we'll plug in three here. We have three plus two. So the left side limit is equal to five. But if we plug in three on the right side, remember on the right side is when we're greater than three. So if we want to take the limit as x approaches three from the right, we're going to do four times three minus seven and 12 minus seven is five. So the left and right side limits match. So this limit exists, it's equal to five. This is definitely true. So this answer choice is out, two only is out. And now we have to decide if the other stuff is true. Now notice f is continuous at x equals three. So the definition of continuity, especially at x equals three, would be if the limit as x approaches three of f of x is equal to f of three. Well, we just found that the limit is equal to five, but the function value at three is determined by the top piece that if we plug in three here, we get three plus two is equal to five. So the limit is equal to five, the function value is equal to five. So yes, our function is continuous at x equals three. So choice B is out. So now we've narrowed it down to this, but if we want to determine if our function is differentiable, what we have to do is first we're gonna take a derivative of our piecewise function one piece at a time, and the derivative of the top part is equal to one. The derivative of the bottom part is equal to four. And I can't assume that our function is differentiable at three. So notice I'm not including the equal to when I take the derivative of our piecewise function. And notice right away that the left and right side derivatives are constants and those constants don't match, which means that we're gonna have some sort of sharp turn here that if we're going from a slope of one to a slope of four, that means there's gonna be an abrupt change like this, we're gonna have a sharp turn. So our function is continuous but not differentiable at x equals three because at x equals three, the left and right side values of the derivative are not heading to the same place. So this is gonna be one and two only choice D. So for question 21, we want to determine where f has a point of inflection. And anytime I hear that phrase, I automatically think f double prime has to change signs. Okay, so we need f double prime to change signs. And when you have a graph of f double prime, notice we have a graph of f double prime here. We need the graph to go through the x-axis. It can't just touch the x-axis, it has to go through it. And notice they gave us an equation here just for extra measure. If you find the roots of all of this, x equals zero is one of the roots x equals a is the next root, and then at x equals b, we have another root. So the roots occur at x equals zero, x equals a, and x equals b. But notice x minus b is being squared, which means surrounding that root, there's not gonna be a sign change. And if you look carefully at the graph here, notice the graph goes from positive to zero, but back to positive. So this is a fake out. We don't have a point of inflection at x equals b but we do have points of inflections at x equals a and at x equals zero, because notice the graph goes from above the x-axis to under at a, and at zero, it goes from under the x-axis to above. So at x equals zero and a only, this is gonna be choice a. Question 22, this is a massive topic on the AP test. The integral of a derivative or a rate tells you the net change of the function. So we're looking for the value of f of one, and what we have is a graph of the derivative. So the idea is that we want to do the integral of f prime of x because the antiderivative of f prime is f of x. And the strategy here is we know what's going on at x equals zero. So we're going to make zero our lower limit and we want to know what's going on at x equals one. So that's going to be our upper limit. And if we use the fundamental theorem of calculus here, this is going to be equal to f of one minus f of zero. So we do the antiderivative at the upper limit minus the antiderivative at the lower limit. But our goal here is to solve for f of one. So we could say that f of one, if we add f of zero to both sides is equal to f of zero plus the integral from zero to one of f prime of x dx. Now this, we could say f of zero, they just gave us is five. But this piece here is the area under the curve. Okay, so just know the definite integral, what does it mean? It's the area under the curve. Or to be more specific, it's the area between the curve and the x-axis. And notice they gave us a nice straight line segment. And when you have a straight line segment, the shape formed is either gonna be something like a trapezoid or it could be a triangle, it could be a rectangle. And here we have a nice right triangle. And the dimensions of this right triangle, it's going one across and it's going up six. So the area is one half base times height. So we're doing six times one is six divided by two is three. So we're gonna have five plus three and this is gonna work out to eight, which matches choice D. For question 23, don't try to do u sub or something else, you'll lose your sanity. You have to know this formula for the AP test. 
So this is the fundamental theorem of calculus part two with chain rule. But anytime you take a derivative of an area function where your upper and lower limits are something other than x and you have some function on the inside f of t dt, this is equal to f of p of x times p prime of x. And then we have minus f of q of x times q prime of x. So this is a real helpful formula to have because in cases like this, see how we're going from zero to x squared, not just x. What we're gonna do is we're gonna replace, we have sine of, instead of t to the third power, we're gonna plug in the upper limit x squared, but then we have to multiply by the derivative of the upper limit on the outside. So we're gonna do times two x. And technically I could stop here and just simplify, but I'll use everything from the formula. This is also sine of, instead of, t to the third power, now we plug in the lower limit, zero. But if we take the derivative of the lower limit, we're just gonna be multiplying by zero. So this piece is just gonna wipe out. So now to simplify this, this is sine of x squared to the third. You just multiply two times three is six. So you have sine of x to the six times two x, the two x we could write in front, and this is gonna match up with choice E. Now to write the equation of a tangent line, this is not necessarily what our curve looks like. Two things you have to know is you have to know the point so you need to have an x and a y, and then you have to have a slope to write the equation of your line. Now just know the y value comes from the function, so we're gonna plug in negative one to our function to get the missing y value. To get the missing slope, we have to plug negative one into our derivative of f of x. And then at the end of this, we're gonna use the formula y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And remember, the point is the x1, y1, and the slope comes from the derivative, and that's the value we're gonna replace over here. So we'll go, we'll go ahead and find f of negative one first. So this is four times negative one to the third minus five times negative one plus three. And now negative one to the third is negative one. So we have negative four, then we get plus five plus three. And I just think of this as eight minus four is four. So the missing point is gonna be negative one comma four. So this is gonna tell us the point of our, well, our point of tangency. Now, in order to find f, prime of negative one, first we have to find what is f prime of x. And f prime of x, we just do the power rule, is gonna be 12x squared and then minus five. So over here, and we'll just color, uh, we'll color coordinate this or color code it. We have f prime of negative one is equal to 12 times negative one squared minus five. And 12 minus five is seven. So now we use this, this is our slope and this is our point and we're gonna plug that into the point slope form equation over here. So we have y minus, remember this is our x1, y1. So we have y minus four equals the slope is seven times x minus, x1 is negative one. So we do minus minus one, that's gonna make plus one. And now this is just y minus four equals seven x plus seven. We're just distributing here. And then add four to both sides. This tells you y equals seven x plus 11. So this is gonna be choice C. Question 25, we have a particle motion problem and we're given the position function. And what we wanna find here is when is the particle at rest? When a particle is at rest, velocity is equal to zero. And to find velocity, you take the derivative of position. So now we take that derivative, we're gonna use the power rule. The derivative of the first term is gonna be six t squared. And now the derivative of minus 21 t squared, we're gonna have two times negative 21 is negative 42. And then we have t to the two minus one. And then the derivative of 72t is just 72, and the derivative of the constant goes away. So now we just have to know a little bit of division here. These numbers aren't the nicest, but we factor out a six, and we're gonna have t squared minus, if we do 42 divided by six, that's seven, and then plus 72 divided by six is 12. And then we're setting this equal to zero. So now we can break this down a little bit more. The quadratic on the inside will factor to t minus four times t minus three, because negative four plus negative three is negative seven. And when you multiply those two, you get positive 12. And now just find the roots. We just take the opposite of the factors and it's gonna be t equals, let's try to draw those brackets a little bit better. So we have t equals three comma four, and that's gonna to correspond to choice E. Question 26 is implicit differentiation with product rules. So what we have here, just know anytime you take a derivative with respect to x of a y term. So that's what we're doing to this equation here, taking the derivative with respect to x. But anytime you take a derivative of a y term, you have to tack on dy dx. So here, the derivative of three y squared, we're gonna have six y, but don't forget to write dy dx. Or you could write y prime. 
And then we have minus the derivative with respect to x of 2x squared is going to give us 4x. And then equals the derivative of 6 is 0. And now for this part, this is going to throw a lot of people off, these little sign changes. If you have to use training wheels, there's no shame in this. Let's say u equals negative 2x, because we're using product rule here. And then v is equal to the other term y. So then u prime, the derivative of minus 2x is minus 2. But be careful, the derivative of y is 1 dy dx. So now we apply the product rule. And remember, we're doing u times v prime plus u prime times v. And now we'll go ahead and do that. So we have 0. And then now we just go ahead and do this. We have 0. And then we do the derivative of this, which is going to be minus 2y. So we do negative 2 times y. And then we have minus 2x times dy dx is minus 2x dy dx like this. Now this is multiple choice. We don't actually have to solve for dy dx and then plug in. We could plug in right now. So we could substitute in x equals 3 and y equals 2. And once again, if this is the AP test multiple choice, time is money. So I probably won't write dy dx. I would probably write y prime. So now I have 6 times y is equal to 2. And sure, we'll go ahead and switch over to y prime since, since we could write that faster. Minus 4 times 3 equals, and we have negative 2 times y is equal to 2, minus 2 times x is equal to 3. And we'll switch this out with y prime. So now we got 12y prime minus 12 equals negative 4 minus 6 y prime. So now we just do a little bit of algebra. And we're going to add the 6y prime to the other side. That's going to give us 18y prime equals. And then you add 12 to the other side. And 12 minus 4 is going to make 8. And now just divide by 18 and simplify. And you're going to have y prime equals. Looks like we're dividing by 2 top and bottom. We're going to get 4 ninths. And that's going to match up with choice B. For question 27, we're taking the derivative of an inverse function. g is equal to f inverse of x. So when we want to find g prime, g prime is equal to the derivative of f inverse. And if this was the free response, this would be the nice notation you could use. f inverse prime of x is equal to, and this is the formula to know, 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. If you can't memorize this formula, the way you derive it is you use the definition of an inverse function and chain rule. But it really helps to just show up to the AP test knowing these formulas. So here we want to find g prime of 2. So g prime of 2 is equal to 1 over f prime of f inverse of 2. So what we have to do here to find this, they told us g of 2 is equal to 1. But remember, g is equal to f inverse. So what that really means here is if g of 2 is equal to 1, then f inverse of 2 is also equal to 1. So that's the first thing we could plug in that f inverse of 2 is equal to 1. So we have 1 over f prime of 1. And notice here, they didn't tell us anything about f prime directly, but they gave us f of x. So f of x, we could just go ahead and find f prime of x is equal to 3x squared plus 1. So to find f prime of 1, we just plug in 1 to our derivative here. And we have 3 times 1 squared plus 1. And 3 plus 1 is equal to 4. So this is going to work out to 1 fourth. And this is going to be choice b. All right, last question of the no calculator section. We have g of x where g prime is positive and g double prime is positive for all real numbers x. We're given these two function values, and we want to find a possible value for g of 6. So for a question like this, we have to know what it means for g prime and g double prime to both be positive. And what that means is that our function is going to be increasing and concave up. And what that means is that the slope of our tangent lines are not only going to be positive, but as we move from left to right, the slope of those tangent lines are going to be increasing, becoming more steep. So for questions like this, it's hard to do all that work in your head. So you have to be able to explore these questions a little bit. So if we sketch this out, let's say I plot these two points. So I have g of 4 is equal to 12. And we won't necessarily say this is drawn to scale. This is just to give us the idea. And then a moment later, g of 5, it goes way up here to 18. So now one thing to consider here is that the slope between these two points, see how we're going up 6 and we're going over 1. So right now, the slope between those two points is going to be equal to 6. But now think about what we said before, that g prime is positive and g double prime is positive, which means as we go on to, let's say, the next value here to g of 6, that we have to go at a steeper rate than 6. Our slope has to be more than 6 when we go from 5 to 6 because we're concave up. The slopes of the tangent lines have to be increasing. So that means a possible value for g of 6 well, g of 6 has to be greater than, we left off at 18. But to get to the next point, we have to be rising and running 
at a rate greater than 6. So that means that whatever g of 6 is, it has to be greater than 24. And notice all of these answer choices, except choice E, are less than or equal to 24, which means these are all out. Okay, so once again, we have to rise and run at a greater rate than 6 to go from g of 5 to g of 6 because the slopes are increasing. Okay, so the slopes are increasing. Okay, well, this is going to wrap up this no calculator section. Thanks for sticking it out to the end, and good luck on your AP test.